Hello, everyone. How are you doing? I hope you all are doing well. Thank you so much for joining us with today's webinar with Media Composer Distributed Processing. My name is Michael Krulik with the Video Product Marketing. And with us today, we also have a demonstration by Kent Peterson, the uh, Senior Solutions Specialist out of Toronto. I'm calling her uh, with you live from Burbank, California. Ken, thank you all for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. So let's uh, take a look. First thing I want to uh, talk about is Q&A. We will have a Q&A after the demonstration of distributed processing, but also feel free to enter any questions you may have in the Q&A portion of the Zoom window. So feel free to, again, go into Q&A, type in your question, and we will uh, present those at the end of the presentation. We also do have some other uh, people from Avid online who, you know, will be able to submit or answer questions there as well, but we would like to answer them all at the end of the presentation so everyone can hear what the answers may be or what the questions are that are posed. So starting off, uh, Media Composer. Media Composer has been uh, out there for over 30 years now. It is the industry leader for film and TV, uh, top winner for uh, editing and the Oscars and Emmys. But uh, there's a lot more than just, you know, editing with Media Composer. That's what we're going to talk about here. So uh, Media Composer, known really well for offline. You know, we are also doing stuff online as well. Here we have a little wheel of fun. We like to talk about the different aspects of Media Composer and what you do get with the software. So uh, amazing trimming and media management, the script-based editing and phonetic search options with Media Composer. The Universal Media Engine, which actually has sped up uh, transcoding and exporting in the software. This is something that was introduced in the 2019, the new modern Media Composer version of uh, the software. So some really great tools with the Universal Media Engine. Adding more support for finishing with HDR workflows, 32-bit float pipeline, uh, ACES, and uh, working with uh, higher quality color spaces within Media Composer. So a full end-to-end -end solution when you are working with the software. Full collaboration, you know, Nexus, you know, our shared storage with bin locking and project sharing. We still have that, still a really strong feature and people like the way we can collaborate with our collaboration tools. Distributed processing, this is why we're here today. So being able to, uh, through Media Composer, distribute any sort of prod, really heavy task-oriented processes like renders, transcodes, mixdowns, and exports. So mixdowns and exports have been added in a recent version of distributed processing, and it is going to streamline the process where you're not having to sit and wait for render bars or progress bars to be seen on the system. You can just keep working. Mastering delivery with Media Composer, uh, we do export IMF packages, uh, originals and supplementals as well as DPX and open EXR files. We do have a really great interop with Pro Tools. So being able to take sequences or turnovers uh, with audio from Media Composer and different versioning and our user definable UI, the user interface. If you're familiar with Media Composer Enterprise, this is a really amazing tool that lets you customize the user experience depending on roles. And, you know, with distributed processing, there might be some people in your team that you want to, you know, disable the ability to distribute the process or turn off project creation or different formats. So Media Composer Enterprise allows you to do that where the administrator can turn on and off functionality depending on the person when they sign into the system. So some really great control there. So like taking a look at the Media Composer product line, we have Media Composer First, which is of course our free version, uh, a little limited as far as tracks and bins and things, but it's a great way to jump into Media Composer and learn it. Moving into Media Composer with great add-ons with Symphony, uh, color correction, secondary color correction and tools, uh, script sync and phrase find. Then going into Media Composer Ultimate, including the Symphony Script Sync, Phrase Find, a News Cutter option, and SRT. If you're not familiar with SRT, Secure Reliable Transport, that's being able to stream the output of Media Composer to anybody in different uh, remote locations. This is through either an application, through the mobile device, through a, a VLC player, to a, a screen, through a Makita, 
uh, device. So a really nice option there with Ultimate or included in Ultimate. Uh, but um, sorry, distributed processing is an add-on to Media Composer Ultimate as well. And again, Ken will get to a uh, demonstration here. But distributed processing is included with Media Composer Enterprise along with anything. So a nice uh, set of tiers here with Media Composer, depending on what you need to have, options available, or Media Composer Enterprise gives you everything, including that amazing customizable user uh, experience. So what does uh, distributed processing do? A little cute animation here. So we have our editor who's working, uh, she's exporting to Nexus, which is the heart of uh, the collaboration, but also the heart of distributed processing. You'll see that the processes can be sent out to worker nodes that could be idle workstations. Maybe somebody's gone for the day or even workstations that aren't being used. You can actually connect as DP workers. And simultaneous processes with mix downs and exports as well. So anybody can be doing any of these processes at the same time and everybody is still working. All of this is happening in the background. So going ahead to uh, distributed processing and what it gives you, again, the processes of renders, consolidates, transcodes, mix downs, and exports. Uh, you'll see here with the Media Composer interface, the new UI allows you to dock or float any of these panels. So the distributed processing status window can be embedded into the UI and you can actually see the processes as they are uh, happening as they're being sent out. Uh, through this dashboard, you'll be able to monitor and prioritize and coordinate any of these processes as well. You can disable, you can change, you know, what might be a priority uh, in the process that you are setting. And the important value here is the increase to your uh, ROI. So uh, being able to use those idle workstations, you just have a computer that's sitting in the closet, turn that into a DP worker and you're adding value to distributed processing and tools that, you know, basically aren't being used right now, and the idle workstations. Again, included with enterprise, an option to ultimate, and you do have to have Nexus shared storage to enable this process. So we'll go ahead and get into the demo. Uh, Kent, go ahead and I will stop the share and you can take over what you need. Well, thank you, Michael. Let's just share my screen here. Can you see my screen there, Michael? I can, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so it's not giving me a long, long demo because needless to say, we're sending everything off to DP. But uh, what we're gonna do first of all is kind of just show you what you will see in Media Composer. So I'm kind of just logged in, basically I'm at the project window here and there's a couple of key things that need to be determined at the very beginning in order to connect basically to DP. I'm gonna call distributed processing DP, just to make it a little bit easier. So the first thing is, is that you need a host name. So the host name is the actual server where it has the broker in that for the distributed processing. So it can be an IP address or it can be name of the server, okay? Then from there, you need to use your username and password. So this could be your uh, username on your domain. This could be your usernames that are on your Nexus system itself, okay? Once you've enabled that and you've hit logged in, it basically should give you a little green uh, dot here. So what that means is now when I go into this project, so I'm going to go into the project, it's going to say, hey, okay, I'm going to connect to a panel, number one. And number two is now I will have access to going to distributed processing as an option when I'm working on things. So as Michael was saying, this is the panel here and I've docked it into my interface just so it's up there. And you'll notice on that panel, it tells me basically all the different types of jobs that have been processed through. So you can see I have some mix downs, I have some consolidates, exports, renders, and all that. That could have been processed straight from this computer itself, but obviously allowing me to continue to work. So I have this timeline right here, a nice long time, little timeline here. Now, how can I use distributed processing? Well, I got a bunch of different options. So I could go, hey, let's do it in an out point, for instance. And at that point, if I want to render, I could render this off. So say I go up here and I go, okay, we're gonna render this. We're gonna say in the out, for instance, uh, nothing to render. And then here we go. At this point, as long as I'm gonna specify a location on my Nexus system, 
it will enable me to have distributed processing. Let's just show you. So if I say my Windows desktop here, you can see I can use my application to do the rendering. I can use background processing, which has been in Media Composer forever, but distributed processing is grayed out. If I go now and specify a location on my Nexus, suddenly distributed processing shows up. So the reason for that is because we have a bunch of workers, right? Basically render nodes that are all connected to the Nexus. The media is all there. And so it needs to be able to access that and then write back so that everybody can share that media. So it's not by itself only. So you can see I can have my distributed processing. And then at that point in time, I could pick a job queue. And the job queue is basically different queues that you can create, whether it's specific tasks that you want to do with um, things. Maybe you want to set up a priority queue. And that's something we'll talk about in just a little bit. But right now, I'm just going to pick this job queue. And I just basically say, OK. And at that point, now it's basically going to just send this off to the job to the workers. And as you can see, you know, I can keep working here down in the left hand side. Basically, it processes out and away we go. OK, now in this case here, what we're also going to do is show you how you can go and use it for different processes. So maybe, you know, I've just linked to a bunch of media and I want to do transcoding or consolidating. Same thing applies here. So I, whether it's consolidate or transcode, all the standard menus will show up as expected, whether it was using your application or not. So, you know, what format, what target, you know, what drives you want to go to. But you also have the capabilities to pick and distribute processing at this point in time. So if I go in here and I say distribute processing and I say, OK, the media is going to be going to there. At that point, I can pick whatever job queue I want. And once again, hit transcode and it will offload it from my media composer. So I don't have to chew up any cycles. I can just continue working. Oh, sorry about that. Shut the phone off normally helps. And then it would just continue. So if I was, you know, bringing a bunch of clips in using UME to link it all, I can then click click all the clips in the bin and say, hey, let's transcode them to whatever DNX 36 or whatever I might want to do. So I have a lot of flexibility on what I'm going to send off to distribute processing. Another thing too, is I also have the luxury of using it for exporting. So if I'm going to say my one of my um, things, so say I have this uh, particular timeline here and I want to go and export it out. This is super handy, especially when you have multiple timelines that you want to export and, you know, typical processes that, you know, media composer is going to have to export it out and then you're going to have to wait and then pick another one or else go to another media composer on your same network, right, to do them. Here I can go and I can say output. Now what you'll see up at the top, I can export to file, which is basically straight from my computer only, or I can say via distributed processing. At that point in time, I could go and say, you know, what format do I want to export this off as? So we'll just say HQX, for instance. I'm going to pick my particular job queue that I want to use. So I'm going to say export. I'll pick a location on the Nexus to export it to so that because I'm going to be using some other machine to export, I need to specify that. I basically say go. And at that point now, what it's going to do is it's going to actually start to process it out and send it off to be exported. So you can see this complete timeline is being exported out to a location on the Nexus system itself. Okay. The nice thing is, you know, obviously during that time I could have been working, I could have been doing more, or I could have sent off another job. So if I would just send another job just for kicks here, let's send that job too. So I'm sending multiple jobs off to, to the system. Now, if I want to, I can just show you quickly, right? So here, there's my Nexus volume that I went to, there's my exports, and there's basically three exports, two exports that I just did, and then one I done did previously at 1150. Okay, and if I double click on them, obviously. Wait a minute. No. No, what the hell is your problem? That was my there, so it's all DNX HQ at that point. So really handy tool to be able to take advantage of other machines, but it's not just other machines. So what, how it all works is basically you install a worker 
okay, on whatever computers that you want to have as worker nodes. Now, like Michael said in the original thing, you can buy Media Composer Ultimate and then you can add workers, so distributed processing workers. Or if you purchase or subscribe, I should say, to Enterprise, you get a worker included. Now, just because you get a worker included does not mean that you have to install it on the computer that Media Composer is running on, okay? It's a totally separate license. So uh, one example could be, you know, we're getting new machines in, we have the old machines. Well, instead of trashing them, maybe we could put workers on those. You know, yes, they're not gonna be the fastest in the world, but for doing different tasks, that's what will work just great. So you can install the worker node on it. So this is what the worker node actually looks like. And once it's installed, basically you're specifying where that edge server is. Well, in this case, edge server could be Cloud UX server. And then how many workers that's gonna run on that spe specific machine. So if you have a super powerful machine, you could say, hey, I wanna have two workers running on this machine. Uh, if you don't have GPU, then you would uncheck that. If you happen to have production management or media central production management, this can also be incorporated into that solution. In my case here, it's more of a standalone scenario where I don't have any asset management or anything along those lines. Now you also see that allow the worker to run when Media Composer is running. So you do have the flexibility of saying, you know what, I wanna send jobs off, but I wanna send it off to my machine all the time in the background. So maybe I have a super powerful machine and I'm just gonna run basically a worker on my own system and I only want it to pick up jobs that I send out. Okay, so it's kind of like background rendering, but much more efficient than the previous versions of Media Composer with the background rendering. So I can do that, or I could say run it in the background and basically anybody can use it. So, and to be really clear, when we do send off a job, we are not sending off the job to a specific worker. The broker is determining what workers are being used. And depending on your job queue would indicate which worker it might go to or multiples of workers, okay? So right now, as you can see, I have mine running in the background. So let's just jump out of Media Composer. So there's a couple of things within Media Composer just to show you. So here's your job status. This job status here is only gonna reflect the jobs that you have done, okay? So I logged in as Kent initially. And so if Michael's sending off jobs, I will not see it in this list here. If I wanna see how, what, how many workers we have enabled right now or running, right now I have currently three workers. So I have one running on the machine that I'm currently working on, Michael's on another machine that has, happens to have a worker, and then we have just a generic worker on another machine. One thing I should mention is that these workers can run on PC or on Mac. Okay, you have the flexibility on either one. Then we also have the job queue. So I'm gonna just show you, these are basically the things that you have within the panel here within Media Composer. So you can monitor things if you need to. Um, one thing like Michael said also, if you happen to subscribe to Media Composer Enterprise, because you can do a custom interface on Media Composer, you can remove the functionalities of using DP, using DP for exporting, for instance, or just, remove certain things. So some people wouldn't even see this. You can also have the flexibility of making it so that individuals do not have all the kind of adminish kind of uh, looking that they would only see the job status here. Let's go off to the web browser here. And so I've logged in basically to that server just with my regular credentials. I actually have logged in as administrator. Up at top, you can see there's the exact same icon that you actually see within the Media Composer itself. And here are all the jobs. So you can see we had a failed job. Michael is sending something right now, or Corey in this case sent a job off. So you can see, you know, there's Corey's, there's Kent's, Corey mixed downs, um, exports, consolidates, all kinds of different jobs. So you can see what the level is on these. You can also set the priority too. So if you need more priority on a specific job that's taking a long time, you can change that number as well. So you do have that capability. One thing too, is that the way distributed processing works is depending on the task that you're doing will indicate whether or not it's gonna to go to multiple workers 
for different workers. So in other words, if I was doing a transcode of a clip, okay, it's gonna send that clip to one worker. It's not gonna break it up. However, if I was to go and do a sequence and transcode the whole sequence, it will basically take all the bits and pieces and throw them to as many workers as it can during that process. Same thing happens with renders and so forth like that. So depending on the type of job that you're doing will dictate whether or not, if you have multiple workers, you can actually send them off to it. So let's just go to this interface, same kind of interface, but let's just talk quickly about job queues. So what a job queue is, ultimately, it gives you the capabilities of specifying what this queue will actually do. So right now, my job queue, I have the capabilities to generate proxies. Now, the generating of the proxies is only if you have media compose or have Nexus Edge, okay? So as just a regular user, if you just have Ultimate and you're not running Edge, basically creating proxies will not be available. And that's a special proxy. If you haven't watched any of the Edge presentations, maybe check that out. That's for streaming in remote situations and that. But in general terms, if you subscribe and you get, you know, DP, you get transcode, consolidate, mix down, render, and export. So if I want to right now, what I can do is I can go into here and we can say, maybe we're going to just create a priority queue, okay? Right. And at that point, I'm going to say, well, that queue can never do that. Um, and it, it can do consolidate. I can't do mix downs, okay? So these are basically the tasks that this priority queue can do. So transcoding, rendering, and exporting. So I save this up. From there, I create a work group, okay? So I'm gonna tag that to there. And at this point in time, I can call this whatever I want. So I could say, you know, this is, call this MC1, for instance. And this particular queue will basically be able to do transcodes. I'm gonna keep consolidate there for one second just to talk about that for a second. And I'm just gonna say save, okay? Then I can go create another one, for instance. And we can do the same kind of thing. So we'll say MC2, for instance. And in this case here, we're going to have this one do, be able to do, say, exports and renders. OK, and we'll hit save. So I can go and now take this, and I can attach these to each other. So let me just refresh this for one second here. Oops, sorry. And so now by dragging that, these two queues or groups are assigned to this particular one queue. Then I have my workers over here. So if we look at a worker, for instance, I expand this worker out, you can actually see the different, um, what the machine is, you know, what software it's running, what kind of machine, is it a PC, is it got graphics on it, is there any plugins? Because that's another important thing too, is in, your workers need to have the plugins that you might be using within your timeline. So in some cases, what you might do is you don't want to necessarily put plugins on every machine, every worker. Um, so you could create a group, right? That says, you know, a priority that just has uh, plugins, right? So this priority one, I need to have my workers that have plugins because who knows what's going to come to it. By dragging, this basically gives you the capabilities now of moving workers to the different work groups, okay? So right now, what would happen if we look at this, right? So the main queue itself says transcodes, re, uh, renders, and exports. So if somebody sent a transcode through, it's going to go to this work group, it's going to do transcodes, and it's going to use these two workers to actually process any kind of transcoding. If I go into here and a worker sends off a render job, it's not going to go to this first one. So it's going to go to the second one and then use that worker. Now, if a person went and sent a consolidate and picked the priority queue, right, in their media composer, then what would happen is nothing would happen because that priority queue will, says it cannot do consolidates. Doesn't matter whether the work group has consolidate or not in it, it's all about the job queue itself. If I wanted to be able to use this, I could go and drag this and drag it to a different queue that enables that capabilities and consolidates. And so I know now Hey, if I send a, a consolidate and I use this particular queue here, that way it will actually funnel here and use these two workers. Okay, so that's kind of 
giving you the idea of what you need to do or how you can create these job queues. Now, super important is that, you know what? You don't have to create any kind of job queue. I can just grab all these guys here, throw them all up at the top here and get rid of all these job queues and have one default job queue that ultimately gives you all the capabilities. It all comes through here and then whatever the the order is of the people throwing things to the jobs or to jobs to the actual distributed processing, it'll pick whatever worker it, it can find that's available at that time. Okay. So whether you want to use them or whether you want to just create one generic, you have that flexibility. And that's the nice thing about it because you might have some machines that have graphics cards. You might have some machines that don't have graphics cards. So depending on the type of task that you might be doing, maybe we don't ever use graphic card, you know, for generating certain things. So maybe I'll just create another queue for those specific machines so that if it's graphics intensive, I go to one queue. If it's not graphics intensive, then I go to a different queue. Okay. So this is basically the way you set up distributed processing. This is the way that you can set up queues for it. As you can see when we do anything in here, so even if I go back now to here and I go into, um, let's just go, oops, excuse me. Let's go output distributed processing. You'll now see basically that right now I only have default here showing up because that's the only queue that has workers assigned to it right now. So that's why it's only going to the, de uh, the default. So if workers happen to be down because maybe someone shut a machine off or whatever, you'd be able to tell based off of what queue is available at that point. So with that all said, pretty straightforward, not a lot to do when it comes down to, you know, sending a job off, using it, seeing what monitoring what's available. Like I said, we we do require to add a, another little server basically that connects to the Nexus to do all the brokerage of it. Nothing funnels through that. So it's really important to understand that nothing funnels through it. Basically all those workers are kind of like headless media composers. So when you send a job off, the distributed pro the, basically the broker just says, hey, okay, worker, pick it up. And so we don't have to pre-package the sequence or anything like that. It just knows, oh yeah, it's just kind of like project sharing. Now, there it is. Let's start processing it out. So with that said, Michael, I think uh, if there's any questions, maybe we'll uh, start to do uh, answer some questions for you. Yeah, absolutely. Great overview. And it's just it's really intuitive if you take a look at what Ken did and being able to go in and assign the worker nodes easily. Uh, why don't I go ahead and go back to my screen? Go here to the presentation. So I mean, just uh, as a quick summary. Uh, to this, the processes that Kent did with render, consolidate, transcode, and mix down, very easy interface uh, with the UI. Uh, the web browser actually provides really great tools for an administrator who doesn't need to go into uh, Media Composer, bring it up. They can actually go in and monitor, prioritize, and coordinate any of the jobs for DP uh, just through the web browser. Uh, and more importantly, it is an option for Media Composer Ultimate and included with Media Composer Enterprise. So a lot of value there. So uh, we'll go to the uh, Q&A section. We did get a lot of questions here. Let me um, bring up, I'm oh, sorry, my screen is like, I can't reach the Q&A. Let's see, sorry, hold on one second. Get that over, all right. So looking at uh, Q&A, a couple, lot of questions here. So do the idle workstations have to run the same or current Media Composer software? Um, if the computers are older, Z800, for example, can you still use DP? Um, it, as long as the worker can run on it, that's the key. So, I mean, RAM, think of, think of the workers as kind of like headless Media Composers. So they will have, you know, they're not doing all the processing and they don't uh, necessarily use all the horsepower that you would if you had the actual, you know, full media composer interface. So, but it would have to be like current OS and software. An 800, you might, you know, it's, 
you might be getting a little bit slow at that point in time, especially on 800, you know, 840, no problem. We have workers running on 840s, no problem. But 800, I, that'd be pretty slow probably. Yeah. So there are a little bit of requirements there. Uh, does Nexus shared storage need to be the source and destination for all, or can it just be the destination? So currently today on the first release, well, not, I shouldn't say the first release, but right now um, it does require to be on Nexus. Uh, we don't have the capabilities of currently with the workers to be able to look at, you know, mounted volumes or something like that. Um, so if you had another NAS, for instance, but the original media needs to um, come from the Nexus currently. Uh Someone has a large dongle-based media composer facility. How can they stay on their dongles and get distributed processing? Um, but the key is, as long as you're on the latest version of media composer, um, like, so if you have a dongle, right, your media composer is not running the, I, I don't even know how to say it, Michael, the, the, the subscription version of Media Composer. It's kind of like an in-between Media Composer and Media Composer Ultimate because it's giving you shared projects um, on, on shared storage. So as long as you're on the latest version of that or not even the latest version, uh, basically I think it's 2020, I believe, um, then you can install distributed processing um, for that environment, no problem. Right. You're not limited to subscription only um, in that scenario. Yeah, so DP can be used. Uh, does distributed processing, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, does distributed processing utilize, I'm sorry, NVENC or other hardware encoding, decoding of H.264 or H.265? No, as I said before, basically it's a headless media composer ultimately. So the capabilities of media composer um, is basically what we're doing. So the only thing that we would use would be a graphics card um, or, the, or CPU and RAM within the machine. Thank you. Um, Jason says he just joined and had some technical issues. What did he miss? Um, well, Jason, uh, this is recorded. So you'll be able to go back and watch this again. I believe it will be available on YouTube. So uh, definitely check that out afterwards. A lot of great information there. Um, what is the minimum version of Avid required for the worker node computer? The minimum version of node for a worker. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. It's, we had a couple of different versions of the worker that it, when we first released distributed processing, basically it only had X amount of capabilities. The latest version of Media Composer gives you all your exports and your transcode consolidates and so forth. I believe we can go, I want to say 2020, but we'd have to check for sure. I think 2021 is where we included exports and mixed downs. Yeah. But there. yeah. So you'd have to be on that, that release. Uh, let's see. How many workers can be used per each Media Central server? How many workers? How so, many <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so far we've um, had, so far we've went to 10 um, because the, the Media Central server really isn't doing any processing and it's really not doing anything. And that we've basically, it's just a broker, right? So there's nothing passing through there of any kind of, you know, substance or like in sense of throughput and all that kind of stuff. So it's not processing anything. So the workers are all independent on the actual computers, right? So, you know, we, right now, I think the documents say 10 workers, um, but that that's just basically our, based on our scaling right now. It, it's going to, it's going to increase exponentially as we, kind of move forward here. I think Peter had some, a couple other questions here. I think this was uh, answered when Ken, uh, when he did the processes and distributed them. Can a single job be split across multiple workers? If so, how many? And can a single computer run multiple worker instances at the same time and split a single task across those instances? Yes, yes to both of those. Like I mentioned originally in the webinar, right? Depending on the type of task it is, will dictate whether or not it breaks it into multitasks 
for a single task. So like a transcode of a master clip, that's considered one task because it's a single clip. Whereas if I had something that had that I was doing an export and it had renders on it, or sorry, effects on it and so forth like that, like a sequence kind of thing where I have multiple clips and all that kind of stuff, then it would break it down into multiple tasks. And in some cases would chunk certain things as well and send it off to different workers. And it'll be whatever workers are available based on the job queue you have, right? It, like I said, we don't, it, it randomizes it accordingly to what's available on the actual queue itself. And what happens if a worker gets interrupted while doing a job? I know you can stop a process, but will workers get interrupted if you send something to the uh, to DP? No, because basically if it's doing something else already, it's, you know, it's not going to stop until it's finished that particular job. And that, so you won't interrupt something. You basically are queued, right, into a queue. That, and you don't, unless you have higher priority than something else, it, it's basically going to just queue you in order. Uh, the next uh, question was related to, I think you'd mentioned it, as far as when you look at the workers, you can see, you know, the AMA or the linked plugins. Uh, and third-party plugins as well. If the project is using third-party plugins like Boris Effects, uh, does the worker computers need licenses to those effects packages as well, or just the main computer, the main user computer? No, the workers would need it as well because you have to remember, right? You're sending the job away from your physical computer to another computer ultimately. So they would have to have it. And that's where I kind of said, you know, you might create queues because you don't want to make, maybe buy a whole bunch of licenses for Boris, for instance, you might say these particular workers have, you know, plugins. So if you're doing plugins, then you use this queue. And if you don't, then use the other queue. Kind of and it's so, intelligent enough if you have, you know, multiple workers to a group, it knows which worker to go to to be able to generate any of those. So that, that there's intelligence yeah. built in there. Exactly. Uh, for transcodes, can camera master media live on non-Nexus non -Nexus network attached storage as long as des the destination is Nexus storage? Yeah, not, not currently with the current uh, release of distributed processing. Awesome. Will be coming, but right now, <laughs> and that's the same thing that applies kind of reverse too, right? Is we're also looking at how can, when I'm doing an export, Right? How can I have it go somewhere else as opposed to just on Nexus as well? So those are two things that are definitely uh, being looked at right now. Um, so Alex is asking about Nexus Edge. You guys, can you explain the Nexus Edge environment in a bit more detail? That might be another session to talk about since this is DP. Now DP is part of Avid Nexus Edge, so it's a, it's a good question. Uh, but he was asking where are the components physically located, cloud or local? So I don't know if you want to touch on that or we can, you know, table I can that. touch on it quickly. Um, basically Nexus Edge, that, uh, the Nexus Edge product basically is to give you capabilities of generating proxies, but be able to edit from a remote location. The solution, so basically the same server that you're running the distributed processing brokerage on is the same server that you could put the edge parts on as well. So it's local to your environment right? But if you want to edit remotely, then I just need a VPN into your environment. And then now we can use the proxy stream, mount Nexus from a remote location and so forth. So it's, if you decide to uh, subscribe to MediaCodes or Enterprise, you actually get Edge included in there if you so desire to deploy it, right? So you can just use Media Composer and DP, or you can, when you do Edge, or sorry, Enterprise, or you can do Media Composer, use the Enterprise functionality to be able to take away features and DP, or you can also add the Edge portion into that same subscription at no additional cost and give you that capabilities of editing from a remote location. So nothing is in the cloud. Uh, it's in your own private cloud, if you want to say it that way. It's the easiest way of saying it. And then you'll get the proxy selection in the uh, grouping in the queue. So besides transcoding and exporting and all those other ones, proxy is one that's added with Avid Nexus Edge. Yeah. Another the nice thing about that proxy is that it could become a new proxy for your environment. 
So instead of transcoding it to DNX36, for instance, if you add the edge part into it, that proxy could be your new proxy for offline within the facility and editing remotely if you want to too. So you do get the flexibility of a new type of proxy, a three megabit proxy too. Yep. Uh, Mark was asking how many workers can we have? I think you mentioned that we you know we've tested up to 10 at this point. 10 currently, yeah. Um, is it virtualized? Is it using VMware? So it can be um, because it's like Media Composer, um, but and so it could use VMware, uh, be installed on a VM server, or like I said, any Mac or PC that you might have around the facility or on you know, the actual editing machines because they're not running 24 hours a day necessarily. Um, and a lot of times I, I would recommend to try it on the editing machines just to see if you even notice it, be frank. And that uh, we've had it on while doing demos and we don't even notice the difference, you know, in some cases, because we're not using every piece of RAM and so forth when we're using our media composers. And absolutely. And the next question has to, uh, about servers. Uh, do I understand it right that I need a second Nexus server to use distributed processing? Not a second Nexus server, a, a Windows-based server. And that and they're in the documentation on our website. If you just do search for uh, distributed media composer distributed processing, in the documentation, it'll give you your base um, requirements basically for a server to run the bits and pieces on it. So it's just a Windows based computer. This is the same server that Nexus Edge would use. Yeah, and, but the, the key thing to understand is that there's different levels, right? The, when you get in the edge, sometimes you, if you start using the web interface for viewing video content and all that, then it's a higher end machine. If you just want to use it for DP, then it's a lower end machine. It doesn't require as much RAM and CPU cycles and that. So it really just depends on what product you're kind of looking at, or if you're looking at a combination of all of them. And we are. We are using Nexus Edge for this. Uh, the question is, the demo seems to be running on Nexus, the Nexus Edge server. Um, so I did stuff scrolling. Uh, as that's not available yet to use distributed processing, do we need to run a Media Central UX environment? Yeah, so yes, our, our wording is kind of confusing sometimes. Um, to be really clear, Media Central, a lot of people associate Media Central uh, environment kind of think of it as, you know, the whole uh, production management database and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the interface is really the Media Central interface, okay? So if obviously Edge is not available right now, yes, you would install basically, uh, it'd be a Linux version on a, um, on a server. Doesn't have to be the same horsepower that you would have in a, you know, Media Central Cloud UX deployment. It's once again, it's a lighter environment. But it, and it would only be running what I showed you today. So that's fully available, you know, as just a standalone kind of disregard that whole edge worded verbiage uh, that we use today. Um, it's basically to me essential interface, but not all the bits and pieces behind it that are required. We're getting a lot of questions here. This is great. Um, what does it take to add on to Ultimate currently without any Media Central servers? Uh, how would we purchase the license? And is that a separate license per worker? Yeah, so you, you can purchase the workers. At, like I'm not sales, but I believe it's about $199 a year for the subscription for a single worker. Uh, and then you just need to obviously purchase, purchase that server, right, um, to run it on. The nice thing, uh, if I'm correct, you can let me know if I'm incorrect, but that license that you buy, again, you can enable that on the media composer so that it can be used while somebody's working or while they're, you know, the system's idle, or you can apply that license to any computer that you may have at the facility. Yeah, I think the key is that you don't have to match up the amount of workers with the amount of editors you have, right? It doesn't mean that people still aren't going to render on their local machines, but at the end of the day is it's just to enable you to offload some, you know, don tasks that take a long time, like exporting is probably one of the prime ones to be able to offload, right? And even transcoding and so forth like that so that you can, you know, build, do, do all your other stuff. So 
you know, you can definitely have a little farm just for those kind of tasks. That, but yes, it's, you know, you buy the workers, there's a subscription base for the workers and you just need to make sure you have that one server. Uh, Peter is asking if he's trying to determine if he's better having multiple 10 cores or a single 64 core system. I guess uh, depends on the processing there. Would 64 core be a better process if you're just using it for a worker? Yeah, it just really depends on what you want to send off to the worker. I mean, the rule of thumb is Base it on whatever the specs are with regards to media composer. What's what's the ideal kind of scenario to have? Whether it's a single, you know, CPU or dual CPU. Certain tasks just don't need the dual um, and that. So cores are important. RAM is super important, obviously, depending on what you're processing out as well. Okay, and then you're obviously your graphics card. If you don't have a graphics card. Uh, per se of, you know, high le higher level or kind of what, I guess the easiest thing to say is go to the website, go to our, you know, uh, media composer uh, docs and see, you know, we have a chart there that basically says, you know, this kind of CPU would be great for these tasks, you know, this, this specific resolutions and all that kind of stuff. You kind of base it off of that. That's probably the easiest way to kind of determine what you're, you know, what you'll get the most out of, and all at the same time, not oversubscribe, right, to hardware, because we're really not using it all, right? A lot of times people buy certain computers because they're going to run, you know, After Effects, and you're going to run Media Composer together, and all that on the same time. Well, remember, this is going to be, if you're going to dedicate it, it's one task only, right? So you might not need to over you know, engineer and overprice a machine out for it. I mean, especially because it's going to be happening in the background. You know, it's if you're not seeing it, it's just processing again to that point, you're not going to need maybe a super powered computer for a worker. Yeah. Um, what individual components are required for a DP setup? Like we like we said, basically yep. a Nexus, a server. Um, on top of it, and then obviously your computers to and install what you're on. Yep. Um, I'm going to leave some of the uh, edge questions towards the end. Let's take a look at, uh, do you need to have a Media Central server, or is there a way to use distributed processing without a server if you already have dongles, mostly dongles? No, no matter what, you have to have that Media, Media Central server. server. Um, is the broker, is the broker running on a local Nexus SDA, like an E2 or E4, or does a separate appliance need to be purchased and installed? Yeah, that's that separate server that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. So you do need that. Yeah. Um, let's see, if a running job gets interrupted or shut down, can the job be recovered automatically or does the flow fail? Okay. Currently, it fails. So it won't, it, won't pick up, it won't pick up the job that's failed. But you'll actually get that indication also in the status, right? So you'll see it X's out. And yeah, start. actually, you, you, most people probably noticed that I got one when I did it today. <laughs> no, I'm not hiding it in that. It that, came out and uh, uh, yeah, it, it fails. And it'll give you an idea. A lot of times, it could be you know media offline. Like if you have some media offline, right? There's no point in doing an export if the media is offline. So it'll fail on that job. But so that was that you media is offline. That was that big red or that red that mark. <laughs> right. Um, will DP ever be available as a standalone service? Uh, what's the minimum license requirement required to use DP at this time? And does DP recognize Avid emulated spaces? I don't know if we can answer that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, DP is expecting Nexus number one, um, and that or ISIS, ISIS or Nexus. And yes, there's minimum uh, versions of software, obviously, that to work with distributed processing. And as we move forward, obviously, you know, additional features will be in it as well. But right okay. now, it's locked to Nexus. Working on Media Central Cloud Azure, will it work in the Azure environment? 
Yeah, there's no reason why it won't. Yeah, because we're talking about VMs. Uh, I can have 16 Media Composer Ultimate and 10 Media Composer Enterprises with 10 computers only for DP running in the same Nexus environment and take all computers and take all computers can have access to workers, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct. You don't have to, yeah. A worker can go to ultimate or enterprise, it doesn't matter. So if you, like you said, buy 10, subscribe to 10 enterprise, you'll get the workers. And then you have 10 workers now available for every other ultimate system that you have in there as well. If the worker licenses are separate add-ons, can they be added to older perpetual licenses instead of requiring ultimate? It, like I said, it can, but once again, versioning is what matters of your media composer, whatever your dongle is set to, that there will be a minimum requirement there. Uh, do we have a link to the chart discussed when an answering the 10 or 64 core question? Uh, I don't know if we have a link. Um, are you talking about for uh, Peter, are you just, talking about for requirements? I think it's just a link, you know, for Media Composer, you know, what's good for 4K, what's good for, you know, that link, that chart. It should be pretty standard. So it should, it's available on our website for minimum requirements. Um, and is there a way to clean up failed consolidation? If that's half done, could it be messy if it's rerun? So, if you're consolidating something and it doesn't succeed, it will be cleaned up automatically. Like so the file won't be completed, right? Uh, like if there's additional, if there's certain files that have completed and certain files that haven't completed, then obviously when running, if you ran it again, it won't duplicate, you know, your consolidates. All right, so uh, that's most of the questions. Let's just uh, we'll hit some of these edge ones. We have a couple more minutes. Can uh, can thank you for hitting this, you know, special Q and A section. Uh, any way in the future, the edge workers can be available for D DR. Is that DP DP and other software such as Adobe or DaVinci, if all are based on the Nexus storage. So. Right now, because it is ultimately, uh, you know, Media Composer code, obviously it's very specific to, um, to Media Composer for distributed processing right now. Now, you know, if Adobe and, and DaVinci have background rendering similar to us, then obviously they can all run it on Nexus as well. There's no limitations there. I, we're not, we're not, you know, developing a, I guess, uh, a render farm for other applications other than just Media Composer. Great. I think that about wraps it up. Let me just check the Q&A. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. The, um, thank you, Jigsaw, for putting in the article describing performance requirements. It actually is in the Q&A if you have access to that. Um, last couple questions. Can workers run on Linux or Windows only? Windows and Mac. Right. Yeah. And if, Mac you set up, if you set up two servers for 20 workers, can a single media composer see all 20 by connecting to the two servers? No. No. <laughs> so right now, there's no benefit of setting up multiple servers just to get additional workers. Like I said, that 10 number is a kind of fluid number right now. Um, it will obviously increase. I don't think there's a hard, no, you can't run 11 um, and that, but it's kind of where we're at right now. It's something to check back in with us for sure if you want to increase that number and you can reach out to, you know, Michael and myself and we'll uh, run into engineering or whatever and kind of see what they say about going to, you know, if you say 20 or 30 or whatever like that, we can check into that pretty for sure. No. Yeah, perfect. Well, I think that about uh, wraps it up. I definitely want to thank uh, Kent for the amazing demo and the super uh, answering the questions as I kept uh, ask, asking them. So a great lineup of questions. Also want to thank the team from the Orville who let us use their demo footage for the uh, demonstration. But uh, thank you so much for joining. 
Stay tuned for more webinars that we have. I'm sure there'll be a lot more coming up with Nexus Edge, with more things with Media Composer, with you know, Avid Edit On Demand. So definitely you'll see a lot more coming from Avid. And uh, thank you all for your time. Have a great day. Thank you very much.